is the Convict Australia podcast. Thank you for tuning in. At three o'clock in the morning on the 10th of January, 1868, the Hugomont cut through the mist and quietly sailed into Fremantle, carrying with it 279 male prisoners. The 14,000 mile trip had been fairly uneventful, but for some, the 89 day voyage from Britain had been the most bleak and miserable of their lives. 62 of the convict men on board were political prisoners from Ireland who had been caught the year before for their involvement in the Fenian movement. Down in the depths of the ship, a Fenian by the name of John Boyle O'Reilly described his experience. Quote, Only those who have stood within the bars and heard the din of devils and the appalling sounds of despair blended in a diapason that made every hatch mouth a vent of hell can imagine the horrors of the hold of a convict ship. End quote. John had originally been sentenced to death for withholding his knowledge that a mutiny was being planned. A date had even been set for his death by firearm, but his sentence was commuted to 20 years. Before he was arrested, he had worked as a reporter. John had a sunny personality and easily made friends, a very useful trait when trying to uncover a story. As they approached the shore, the Fremantle prison, or the convict establishment, as it had been previously known, loomed large. The limestone building had been built using the blood, sweat and tears of convicts and dominated the landscape and town of Fremantle. Nearly 10,000 convicts had passed through its gates since 1850. It was here that John and his fellow Fenians and convicts would be processed and assigned work. Sometime later, they were led in groups from the ship. John looked around, taking in the surrounds and realised that the establishment wasn't the only prison, but so too was the thick, uninviting wild bushland. But he was not to stay in Fremantle for long. He, along with other convicts from his ship, were sent to Bunbury, a coastal town which lay south of Fremantle. There they were split into gangs to work on building roads through the dense bush that was just outside the town. At Bunbury, they toiled from sunrise to sunset, with the searing sun beating down on them. The intense suffocating heat was a complete contrast to their former lives in Ireland. The days were monotonous, and as they performed their back-breaking work, many convicts entertained ideas of ending their life. One poor soul was so desperate that he cut his left wrist hoping to put an end to his misery, but after fainting away, he was led away and restored back to health. Others tried to stay positive by reminding themselves that they could be completing their sentence in the overcrowded, dark infested prison cells back in England. At least here, they were outside in nature, breathing fresh air in open spaces. John's thoughts always turned to the same thing, escaping. He knew he could not survive 20 years of this. There were only two ways to escape, through the bush or by the ocean. The bush was considered suicide as men before him had tried and died or turned back due to starvation and thirst. That's if the native trackers didn't find you first. John put his energy into becoming a hard worker and soon caught the attention of his overseer. For his good conduct, he was pulled away from the harsh work and was entrusted with a new task of running errands and delivering reports to the convict depot. It was around this time that he began confiding in the local reverend, Father McCabe. John had almost reached his limit. He felt so desperate that he told Father McCabe that he was considering making a break for it into the bush. The father's response was, quote, It is an excellent way to commit suicide. Don't think of that again. Let me think out a plan for you. 
End quote. Months passed, and John became increasingly impatient. Finally, the father devised a plan and set it in motion. He enlisted the help of a man named Maguire and asked him to use his contacts with the New Bedford Whaling Company to stow John away on board their vessel. Three of their whaling vessels were due to arrive in February. John agreed to wait the two months until they arrived. When February was upon them, Maguire approached John with good news. Captain Baker of the whaling ship Vigilant had agreed to smuggle him out of the colony, but he wanted John to row out of Australian waters and meet him. On a warm summer's evening in February, John made his move. He managed to slip out and make his way to a predetermined hiding spot at the edge of the woods and hold up under a huge gum tree. There he waited until around midnight when he heard Maguire whistle the St. Patrick's Day tune, signalling it was time to move out and start his escape. John, Maguire and a friend of Maguire's rode throughout the night where they met a boat waiting for them. John boarded the boat at daybreak and an oarsman rowed him to the southern point of Geograph Bay to wait for the passing vigilant. John had brought no food or water with him. He spent the night on the shore and woke with terrible hunger pains and yearning for a drink. The day was hot and he spent it waiting for Maguire to come back to him with food and water. Want to hear more great stories about convicts? Then grab a copy of Convict Sydney, the real life stories of 32 prisoners. From Elizabeth Sullivan, who was known about town as the fighting hen of Cook's River, with her flamboyant dress and tough countenance. To Robert Sidaway, who entertained local residents by hosting dramatic performances in his theatre. These colourful characters and their individual experiences offer a broader insight into the daily happenings of Sydney and the convict system. To get your copy, just click on the link in the show notes. By the afternoon of the next day, the white sails of the Vigilant could be seen in the distance, so they hurriedly pushed off in their boat and rowed out to the meeting point. But John's hopes were dashed when the Vigilant sailed right past them. The men rowed back to shore with a confused and disheartened John. Deflated, they found a hiding spot for him nearby and promised to return in a week. In the meantime, they would approach another whale ship and see if they could get him passage on board. Desperate, John took a boat the next morning. His determination spurred him on and gave him the energy he needed to get far enough for a passing whaling ship to pick him up. He rowed all day and slept in the boat that night. The next day, he spotted the vigilant again and frantically waved his hands about to get their attention. But, alas, Captain Baker and his crew did not spot him. Frustrated and disheartened, he turned his boat around and rowed back to shore. He rode all night and into the next day, and when he finally made it back to where he had started, he felt utterly exhausted and collapsed in a heap on the sandy beach. For the following five days, he spent most of his time sleeping off his epic journey. When his friends finally returned, they brought with them good news. They had arranged his safe passage with Captain Gifford on board the whaling ship Gazelle. John was overwhelmed with emotion and gratitude to hear that Father McGabe had given the captain £10 to ensure he was picked up and cared for on the journey. The next morning, with a renewed vigour and determination, John and his friends pushed their boat off the shore, hopped in and earnestly began rowing out. They rowed till noon when the small boat Clarice met them. John said a quick goodbye to his friends and stepped onto the Clarice, which transferred him to the Gazelle. He turned to take one last long look at New Holland, relieved to be leaving, but saddened to leave his friends behind. For the next six months, the Gazelle chased whales. John was astonished at the kind treatment he received from the captain and everyone on board. He wrote to the newspaper, The Irishman, quote, 
When the captain knew who and what I was, he installed me cabin passenger, and as he was on a six-month cruise for Wales, I remained on board for that time, and every day had a fresh instance of his kindness and of the officers and all on board, end quote. One of the men even saved John's life when he decided to participate in a fight with a whale. John's inexperience nearly cost him his life. He was close to drowning, but the third mate named Hathaway saved him. The gazelle made many stops along their journey, and rumours spread that John was on board, being aided in his escape attempt by the captain. When the vessel reached the British-occupied island of Rodriguez, which lay roughly 560 kilometres off Mauritius, the governor was waiting for them. He and his officers came on board, demanding that Captain Gifford hand John over. At that point, the chief mate spoke up. Pointing up to the stars and stripes flying from the mast, he said, quote, I know nothing of any convict named O'Reilly who escaped from New Holland, but I did know Mr. O'Reilly, who was a political prisoner there, and he was on board this ship, but you cannot see him. He is dead. End quote. Not entirely convinced, the governor had no choice but to leave the ship. The gazelle pressed on. They had intended to stop at Mauritius but the captain did not want to risk John's capture by the English. When they reached the waters off the Cape of Good Hope, the captain accompanied John in a small boat, and together they rowed out to another vessel called the Sapphire. The Sapphire was under the charge of Captain E. J. Cedars. Captain Gifford explained John's situation and asked Cedars if he would take him the rest of the way to New York. John said goodbye to Captain Gifford and thanked him profusely for all that he and his crew had done for him. Not only had they given him passage and saved him in Rodriguez Island, but they had also taken up a collection of money to help him on the next leg of his journey. John had been overwhelmed by their generosity and made a promise to himself to repay them some day. True to his word, Captain Cedars delivered him safely to the shores of New York. Before parting, he looked John square in the eyes and, quote, shook hands warmly with the felon and said he wished he could save a dozen of O'Reilly's countrymen, end quote. Captain Cedars handed him more money from himself and the chief mate of the Sapphire before sailing away. John was so moved by all the compassion and help he had received on his journey. John was never recaptured and soon became an American citizen. He established himself in Boston, working first as a journalist, then eventually becoming a part owner of the pilot newspaper. John never forgot the kindness he was shown and strove to repay all that had helped him. He wrote to several newspapers acknowledging the men who had assisted him. He had written to the Irishman imploring, quote, Should anything happen to me, the gentleman who assisted me shall not lose his money. End quote. The years passed by, but John just couldn't shake the thought of his Fenian friends that he left behind doing hard labour back on the road gangs in New Holland. In 1875, he, along with the help of some others, devised a cunning plan to rescue their friends. But you'll have to wait till the next episode to hear that story. Oh, before you go, if you'd like to see photos of John, please head to the Convict Australia Instagram page. Links are in the show notes. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Convict Australia podcast. If you'd like to show your appreciation and get more involved, there are a number of ways you can. The first is by signing up to Convict Australia on Patreon and you will get some perks like the Convict Australia newsletter. Secondly, leave a review and tell your friends and family. This really does make a huge difference. And lastly, join the Facebook and Instagram group Convict Australia. All the links I've mentioned will be in the show notes. Thank you again. Till next time.